Um, we here at Unpack hope that you are feeling safe and well. My name is Iman Ali, and I am the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, much of my work here at MPAC revolves around engaging with my community, the media, and government um, in ensuring a public understanding for American Muslims. So it's for that reason um, that I am thrilled to be the moderator for our webinar today. Um, justice in the time of pandemic, are the incarcerated being protected from COVID-19? Um, as always, for those on Zoom, please feel free to utilize the Q&A uh, portion at the bottom for any questions you'd like to ask. For those joining us on Facebook, um, I, I commend you to please uh, ask your questions there as well, as we will be having a question and answer portion towards the end with our esteemed guest. Um, speaking of our guests, it's my honor to welcome Seema Safi and Adnan Sultan from the Innocence Project um, to join us today. So without any further delay, I'm going to pass the mic over to MPAC's own visionary and president, Salam al Mariyadi, um, to get that conversation started. Thank you, Iman. Thank you for uh, bringing this uh, very important program together for us. And uh, I wanted to start uh, by asking both uh, Seema and Adnan, how you know, what's the normal basis of your work and how has that changed now since the spread of COVID-19? So I'm happy to start. Um, so the Innocence Project, as you probably know, is uh, we're both a legal clinic and a criminal uh, justice resource center, and we work to exonerate the wrongfully convicted largely through post-conviction DNA testing. And so all of our clients are people who have uh, been arrested, been convicted, gone through appellate processes, and are in a situation where they are challenging uh, their convictions uh, on a claim of innocence. And we also have a research department that uh, studies the causes of wrongful convictions. And we also have a policy department that works to um, implement and develop reforms to prevent wrongful convictions. So a lot of that work is still ongoing um, in this pandemic, and we are fortunate and have the luxury to be able to do a lot of that work from home because we have access to computers and um, can still, you know, work with prosecutors to a certain extent and um, to a less certain extent courts. And there are a lot of changes that have happened since the pandemic began uh, because of the impact that COVID-19 has had on incarcerated populations, which we can go into more detail about. And so gotcha. it has impacted the way that we are representing clients who are in a particular position in their cases. It has also impacted the campaigns that our policy department is engaging in to try to you know, urge governors to release people who are in our country's jails and prisons because that is the um, greatest way to increase uh, you know public safety and protect public health and we can go into some of that in more detail too. Thank you. Thank you Seema. Adnan, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's a, actually a really good summary. I mean I think um, and probably something we'll talk about more is that uh, I, I think this moment, uh, the the um, a lot of criminal justice organizations um, and advocates are are hyper are very focused on addressing uh, incarcerated clients um, and advocating to get um, as many clients out uh, of incarceration because of um, you know the unique risk that incarcerated clients are in as a result of this. Um, Virus. Um, you know, we, we work with a group called Death Penalty Focus, and uh, it's it's led by uh, an ally of ours. Um, his name is Mike Farrell. He he he, he was an a he's an actor. He he played uh, B J Honeycutt in the in the series Mash with uh, Alan Alda, and uh, the dinners that we've gone to is just amazing. How many people have actually been wrongfully convicted? some of whom have been released, and even the number of people released is astonishing. Imagine how many have actually been executed or have been in, uh, in, in prison for, for terms that um, are not justifiable and, and were wrongfully convicted uh, for those, uh, situation, those situations. Um, 
what, what, what can you tell us about the percentage of wrongfully convicted inmates in the, UN, in the United States? So it's impossible to know, but you know, we do know that there are about 2.3 million uh, people in prison in the United States. And to date, uh, there's a little shy of 370 people who have been proven innocent um, after they were convicted, so exonerated based um, on post-conviction DNA testing. And that's just based on DNA. And so the University of Michigan uh, maintains a registry, a list of people in the United States who have been exonerated through DNA and non-DNA, and that number exceeds 2,600. And those people have spent about 23,000 years in prison altogether for crimes they didn't commit. And so extrapolating from those numbers, um, some have made a conservative estimate that about 1% of the US prison population is wrongly convicted. And some have said as high as eight to 10%. So using that conservative estimate, that is about 20,000 innocent people in our nation's prisons. And using the larger estimate, um, it's estimated to be as large as 10%, which is about 230,000. So that's what, however you slice it, a significant number of lives lost and families destroyed and communities destroyed. And, 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 I, and I, I think just something to add, is, and one of the reasons why it, it is hard to give that number is that it is very hard um, to prove, one, to prove someone has been wrongfully convicted as a first instance. And it's also hard to get back into court to even have the chance uh, to do that. Um, Seema talked about, um, well, and, and one of the reasons is, as I think the American justice system um, really values finality in convictions, that they like to have a conviction and that the appeals process is full of procedural hurdles that make it very difficult once you've been convicted to get back into court and challenge that conviction, that the system's designed to do that because in courts talk a lot about, about this idea of finality and the importance of finality. Um, so one of the things our organization does, Seema talked about different facets of our organization. One of the things that they do is the policy department in terms of uh, working with legislations to change laws that make it easier to get back into court to challenge, um, to allow folks to challenge their conviction in light of the numbers we know of how many people are wrongfully convicted. Um, I think one of the biggest accomplishments that our organization's been able to do is, and I think Stephen Cardinal, if I'm wrong, I think every state has a post-conviction DNA statute of some point, of some, you know, some sense that allows you, regardless of how many years you are out, you've been convicted. And the, despite the fact that under normal circumstances, you would be barred from going back into the court, that if you're making a claim on DNA evidence that they will allow you to get back into court regardless of time. But that's just DNA evidence. As um, Simon was saying, we have a research department that looks at all the causes of wrongful convictions and DNA is not just the only one. There are other factors. Unfortunately, if it's not, if you're not going in on a DNA claim, it, it is very hard to get back into court. Uh, we honored somebody last year named Yusuf, Dr. Yusuf Salam. He's part of the Central Park Five. These were five uh, African-American teenagers who were wrongfully, wrongfully convicted for a, a case, a, a brutal rape. Uh, it was a, definitely a devastating case uh, of a, a white female, uh, a, a woman, uh, who was uh, running at the time through Central Park, and she was raped and, and, uh, and almost... Uh, um, almost suffered, suffered death. She was almost killed. Um, in any case, the point is that there were African Americans who were wrongfully convicted. It wasn't DNA testing that, that got their, uh, no, number one, they all served time. And, and so it wasn't until after they served did they find out who the real uh, criminal was. And, and um, I'm not even sure if the city of New York or the state of New York <clears throat> ever apologized to them or rescinded their, I think they did rescind their, uh, their conviction. But um, it, it points to the, the problem of minorities, a disproportionate number of minorities serving in U.S. prisons. And can you talk to us about, about that staggering figure? 
Yeah, I, I mean, the there's this uh, very um, effective billboard that the NAACP has put up, and I remember because it caused a stir in the Philadelphia airports, and and there had to be a lawsuit brought to allow them to post it that says, "Welcome to the United States, where we have." 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. Um, you know, and I think one of the most important parts of, you know, spreading, a, of, of discussing incarceration is building awareness of selective prosecution, selective policing, over-policing of poor neighborhoods, of black and brown neighborhoods, and you know, more and more people understand that the number of black and brown people who are in prison is not a reflection of the number of people committing crimes. It's just a reflection of the number of people who are being heavily policed and heavily prosecuted. And I think post Ferguson, post Black Lives Matter movement, post innocence organizations around the country bringing you know, um, you know, cases of, of the wrongfully convicted, there is a greater awareness of looking at criminal justice as a racial justice issue. Um, and, you know, now there's more progressive DAs and offices who are stopping, you know, prosecutions of low level offenses to try to, you know, put a dent in some of the racial injustice that we're seeing in our country. Um, they're trying to remove, you know, money bail where people are held in county jails just because they can't pay a $75 court fine, which means like a mother of seven can't parent her children, she'll lose her job. Um, and when she goes to the judge to be sentenced, you know, she can't even prove to the judge like, look, I can support my family, I will go to counseling because she's been held in jail without the ability to do that kind of stuff. And so these jails are becoming debtors prisons where, you know, you're only in jail because you can't afford to pay your way out. Um, that doesn't answer your question, but you know the staggering num the numbers of you know people who are in prison who are black and brown is is really just you know modern day slavery, and there is just um, I think one of the you know some of the you know greatest work that's being done is decarceration efforts work to focus on mass incarceration, and I think some of the beginning of that movement is really just building awareness. And, I, and, I, and just to add on that, I think like one of the clearest, um, I think a clear example of seeing that and, and the way policymakers um, and the general public sort of talk about, where, where you see this play out is I think a clear example is um, like the war on drugs. You, you look at things, um, the way things were in the 80s and 90s when, um, there was a crack epidemic that mostly was impacting folks of color in the inner city. Um, and that was seen as a war on drugs and the way you dealt with it was by incarcerating folks, arresting them, incarcerating them for having possession of drugs um, and things like that. And now we have another, we recently before this had a, an epidemic with the opiate crisis, which um, largely impacted um, white, white people. And the way that's been talked about has been a healthcare issue that that should be treated, that people who have opiate addiction should be receiving treatment to get over that addiction rather than um, being incarcerated the way that folks of color were when it was crack. And I think that conversation, the way people are dealing with that, I think is a pretty clear example of um, how we think about race in the criminal justice system. Yeah, That's I mean, just one of many. Yeah, and I think for, for Muslims, the parallel is how the U.S. government dealt with ISIS versus how it deals with white supremacy. Right. Uh, for ISIS, it was, let's just throw the key out and you know, put them in jail and throw the key out and, and, and that's it. For uh, white supremacy, it's let's see what happened that traumatized this individual to go to such lengths, even though it's been shown that white supremacist violence has surpassed uh, the level of ISIS violence in, in the United States. And, and one thing to add, I mean, just something that we, you know, in New York about seven years ago, there was, um, in the last mayoral administration, was the stop and frisk policy that was implemented about stopping and searching um, largely people of color in low-income neighborhoods and um, that, you know, garnered a lot of distrust between people in the community and the police. And, 
you know, the, the amount of contraband that was actually recovered as a result of that policy was, I think, in the single digits in terms of like guns that were recovered, certainly not enough to justify that policy. And, I, and what I would tell people is like, can you imagine if the NYPD went, you know, at the NYU dorms, you know, in Greenwich Village, like those white kids are walking out of their dorms. I have news for you, kids in college do drugs too. And that they were pulled over, put up against the wall and searched when they were on their way to class. Do you think any NYU parent or the NYU school administration would tolerate that? Of course not, There'd be, they'd be outraged by that. And, and the fact that that's allowed to happen in neighborhoods of color, but it would never be tolerated in a predominantly white area, I think is a pretty clear example of how we, how the powers to be view criminal justice issues. Now, uh, you know, for, for whatever reason now, the attention has been shifted to what's happening in, in, in American prisons because of COVID-19. Um, tell us how that has, you know, how that has materialized. Why are we looking at, at prisons in terms of the spread of the pandemic now? I, I mean, sorry. No, no. I, I think because the way prisons are and the way people are treated in prisons, that it runs counter to all of the, the public health messages we've been getting and is you know like a petri dish for the spread of the virus. Um, prisons you know, aren't that clean. They're not very sanitary. Um, things like, you know, washing your hands and those things aren't really prevalent in prisons. Social distancing is impossible or, you know, that doesn't happen in prisons. People are put very close together, whether it's when they sleep, when they eat. Um, you know, healthcare in prisons isn't good. Um, so that all the things that all the sort of components that would go into a rapid spread of this virus um, all exist in prison. And the uh, there are a couple other things um, just to add to that, you know, like Adnan said, prisons and jails are, you know, incubators for disease because of the unsanitary conditions, because of the crowded conditions, it's impossible to practice social distancing when you think about if people are living in dormitory style, um, you know, facilities with a hundred or more men and women in a room, a handful of sinks, showers, toilets that everyone is using, even double occupancy cells, bunk beds are, you know, within three feet apart. Um, people in prison have a very limited, if not no way to maintain good hygiene. Like if you look at certain prisons, they issue um, and we all know what hotel bar soap looks like. They issue like one of those to each person every two weeks. And I would go through that just myself in a couple days. Um, other amenities you have to buy in a commissary. And if you don't have family spending money to, or who has the money to give to you, you have to pay for that yourself. And you get paid 15 cents to 50 cents an hour for working in the kitchen or any job in a prison. So, um, you know, prisoners aren't allowed to have anything that is 60% or more alcohol based. And I think that's all hand sanitizer. And what's interesting is, you know, Governor Cuomo announced that incarcerated people were beginning to produce hand sanitizer, which is another huge problem that I hope he ended, but it's not clear because they were being paid like 20 cents an hour to do that. Um, a lot of prisons and jails are exceeding 100% capacity with overcrowding and so squeezing more and more people into these small spaces. Um, they're also at risk of contracting the disease from staff. You know, you have, uh, you know, corrections officers who are in frequent physical contact with prisoners and jail inmates and who are subjecting them to body searches, cavity searches. They're subjected to, you know, exposure to medical staff, kitchen staff, and you have, you know, disadvantaged groups, including people of color, who are disproportionately incarcerated, and they're also disproportionately lacking in equal access to health insurance and healthcare before they get in. So what that means is, because they're receiving substandard preventative care before they even get in, once they're entering prisons and jails, they're at increased risk of health complications. And I read a study that 
about half of prisoners um, have a chronic health condition. And so, you know, that's coming into a prison itself that has very, very poor medical care. Um, and so when you have inadequate preventative measures to limit the spread, it can't be managed internally in the prison. So you have these critically ill prisoners who are gonna arrive at outside hospitals. Many of them are gonna have fewer and fewer beds. And inevitably that'll sap the resources of nearby healthcare facilities. And so the more prisoners who are exposed means the more people in the wider population are exposed. And so we've even heard of wardens telling their staff um, to go against doctor's orders to self quarantine and go back to work where they have been exposed. We have heard that staffers are bringing the virus to the incarcerated. We've heard that when you know a staffer or a corrections officer has been exposed, they're bringing that back to families. They're bringing that back to the communities. And so you know the spread of the virus is infecting communities at large. And so without measures to reduce the prison population, what you're going to see is this you know catastrophically high price of mass incarceration, both for people in prison and for the communities around them. And um, I, I, you know we're studying right now a bill by uh, Congressman. Jerry Nadler from New York and Congresswoman Karen Bass from Los Angeles that is seeking criminal justice reform in our prisons. And they're linking their legislation, legislation to some statute back in the 60s or the 70s um, that regulates uh, our, our prisons. Uh, what, what, what do you believe is needed now to mitigate the spread of the pandemic in, our, in, the, in the US prison system? I mean. Uh, Good. So, you know, one thing, some prisons have started preventative measures, like they have started to look at, you know, disinfecting areas, limiting, you know, eating and rec time to smaller groups, but those measures really fail to implement enough policies to adequately prevent the transmission of this virus. And so to really help stop the spread, the safe to, safest response is to release as many people as possible and to reduce the number of people coming into the prison system. And, you know, that would protect the people who are released, the general public, people who are in prison, who have to staff the facilities. And, you know, our policy department has joined like a coalition of organizations calling on the governor to act immediately. And what they're saying is, you know, there's no, there's really, there's no reason to be afraid. Oh my God, we're letting murderers and rapists out, like the people that they're focused on are people whose health risk profile or their age or their you know, conviction is in a particular category. Yeah. And so you see people who um, are scheduled to get out in the next couple of weeks or the next couple of months who had a drug or alcohol related offense. Those are the people being prioritized or, or who advocates are trying to prioritize when they talk to the governor and engage in these campaigns. People who have violated a condition of their parole and were sent into prison. Um, and so, you know, there's low risk, you know, people in prison who can be released. And, you know, there are some examples that we can give of what states have been doing um to try to reduce the population but it's really that is one of the you know most effective and and safest way to ensure that um people in prison as well as the communities at large are not going to see the vast spread of this virus any more than it has already spread and i think cook county has uh what, what two three hundred cases already and that includes prison guards so you have people walking in and out of the prisons uh, going to their neighborhoods, their families, that could potentially spread that virus. Yeah, yeah. and federal prisons have had hundreds too, yeah. Go ahead, okay. Adnan. No, no, I was just, I, I mean, that's a big problem. Right. Um, well, I, you know, we have a lot of questions, and I'm going to hand it back over to Iman, so about 15 minutes uh, left, uh, we'll, we'll take these questions. Go ahead, Iman. Yeah, so thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Um, as a future, aspiring future attorney myself, I'm just blown away by the work the Innocence Project has always done. Um, and so we have quite a few questions, um, and I will be adding a bit of my own twist to them as well. Um, so let's just start with the beginning. You know, um, the goal of the Innocence Project is to, you know, help the release of wrongfully accused um, 
of individuals in, in, in US prisons. So just start with us, for us, the, the difference, if you can, very briefly, and what the difference is between prisons and jails. I think the public defender want to take that one. <laughs> um, I mean, I think generally prisons are, or jails are um, places where people are held pre-trial what you know before they've had a trial or their case has been disposed of um, and prison is where someone would go after they've been convicted or pled guilty um, I mean jails are usually shorter term places so in New York for example um, Rikers Island is the um, jail for the city or one of the jails for the city um, if you have a you know, you take a plea or you went to trial and your sentence is less than a year, you'd stay mm -hmm. at Rikers Island in jail. If it's longer, you'd go to a state prison. So okay. it's, that's generally the distinction. So and I think also jails are, sorry, jails are also run by like the municipality, like a local county or municipality or maybe a sheriff's department. And then um, states run. Prison, prison. Yeah, prisons are state run facilities. Okay. So, you know, when in this time, I'm thinking, I, I was reading an article earlier about a prison in Chino, um, California, um, which is at 120 capacity, 120 percent capacity, despite um, releasing almost 3,000 inmates. Okay. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I have been on planes, I've been in bus rides, even, you know, when you sit on a roller coaster ride, they're not pushing you know, 10% extra, 20% extra people in these spaces, you know, they're public spaces, but nobody pushes, you know, it doesn't make sense to us. Even in our own houses, you know, we like to sleep one, one to a bed, if you're married, two to a bed, whatever. So why is it that, that we are seeing such a high capacity um, being pushed, kind of shoveled into these spaces and, and, and what, what allows that to happen? I mean, I think it, you know, it goes back to, I mean, part is what Steema was sort of mentioning when she talked about that, um, I guess it was NAACP um, billboard you saw at the airport about um, how this country incarcerates a lot of people um, mm -hmm. and that, uh, you know, that results in you know, having to really squeeze a lot of people in prisons. Uh, you know, I think there's also, and this this is more complicated if you've seen like the Netflix documentary um, 13th, 13th that sort of talks about the so good. justice system. But, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in um, the sort of prison industrial complex. A lot of that money is tied to um, number of inmates. So, you know, there's an incentive to get as many people in the place as possible because that usually res results in a facility or someone getting more money for it. So there isn't really an incentive not to um, uh, incarcerate people. So to our viewers, I, I highly recommend watching the Netflix that Adnan mentioned, 13. It's on Netflix. Um, I'm sure it's available in other spaces. 13th, right? But and let me make another Netflix plug here. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Innocence Project uh, has a Netflix series that's dropping today, right, Sima? Um, yeah. Called uh, Innocence Files that looks at, um, I think it's like four, of ca four cases um, that resulted in wrongful convictions and how it happened and kind of giving you the inside story to it. So um, check that out. Um, you should watch that over the Tiger King. Yes, Tiger that's King. what I was going to say next. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So my next question goes a bit into um, the highest court of the land. You know, in the Supreme Court, there was a case, I believe, Estelle v. Gamble, in which um, Justice Thomas wrote the opinion in which he said, you know, health care uh, has to be afforded to prisoners because we in very layman's terms can't protect them necessarily from the cruel and unusual punishment that an open society would, would allow them protection from. And my 
question now is, you know, in, in the experiences that you've had, um, specifically since the pandemic has, has risen, um, do you see these adequate healthcare needs being met? And if not, do you think that this is enough? I know we spoke about this earlier, but do you think that that in itself is enough to release um, prisoners early? You mean the inadequate health care in the prisons? Yeah, or protections from the pandemic, even. I mean, I think that's a really important argument to be made because the medical care in prisons, and probably even more so in county jails, is so substandard. Um, and it's also going to be, if, if there are people who are sick from the virus, then those already, you know, inadequate number of nurses and doctors are going to be attending to them and the people with the chronic underlying conditions are going to you know have even more severe complications and would have to be sent to outside hospitals so i think that's an argument to be made um i wanted to add one point to your other question about the um what was it overcrowding of i don't know if it was the county jail you were talking about but you know there's so much stuff that is over criminalized in this country, like doing like loitering. I don't know what that is. Disorderly conduct that could be taking a chair and like walking it across the street. And I'm only giving that example because um, I saw it somewhere, you know, cursing at a cop. I had to defend somebody in the train who once called a cop an asshole because she has a first amendment right to do that. He said, I'm going to cite you and put you in jail. It's like, you can't do that, but you know, they think they can do that. Um, jumping a turnstile, you know, if you don't have $2.50 to like go in the New York City subway, like they just will fine you or put you, you know, in a jail, you know, people who, like Adnan said, it's like a money making enterprise. And so that's another big issue is that so much is considered a crime in this country. And like, just because you do something that you might advise your child not to do doesn't mean that you should be thrown in prison for it. Absolutely. So there is a study, I believe it was released a few years ago by um, a gentleman named Bruce Western. It was known as the Boston Reentry Study, um, in which he um, spoke with about 120 inmates who were about to be released one month before their release back into their communities. And he asked them an array of questions. And just um, prior to prior to this webinar, I was, I was a bit curious, you know, what is life like when you re-enter society? Um, and, and I'm even more curious knowing now with, with certain barriers to, you know, housing and, 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 you know, people not necessarily working in the normal office space and things like that, and government programs, you know, maybe being at a halt. Um, say that, you know, the, we, we, get the, we get the prize, we get the inmate released who was wrongfully convicted, um, in the Boston Reentry Study, it, it, it said that on average, most people leave with a little less than $400 in their pocket. And I'm just thinking, you know, that might get you one or two nights of hotel stay. But after that, what does a person do for housing? What does a person do for food? Um, does the Innocence Project do any work with helping people re-enter into society? And, and even now, I want to know, with your experiences, what, what is kind of happening to the people who have just been released and thrown back into society? So, I mean, I can start off. I, I mean, we, we do, um, when we have clients who get exonerated um, and then are released um, from prison after that exoneration. We, our organization is fortunate enough to have social workers and we, we have the means and the budget to um, help clients, you know, preliminarily get set up um, with housing to the extent we can assist with employment um, and getting them set up. We, we are able to do that for, um, clients who who are who are exonerated um you know we also have um you know I'm, i have a case right now where our client will parole out before we're sort of finished with the representation now that's not a client who's exonerated um and we'll still be working on the case while they're out and that client will be released uh without with the criminal record and um and this client happens the crime he was committed convicted of was a sex offense so that's 
you know, there are, you know, so many barriers for someone like that to get back in. Um, finding employment, very difficult if you have a felony, let alone something like a sex offense. Finding housing, we have very strict laws about you know, where someone of a certain conviction can live from certain areas. And that really complicates the ability to find housing that is sort of necessary to kind of get back, um, you know, reacclimate yourself. Um, and there's also a lot of like psychological issues that come in after you've spent decades institutionalized and, and what that is um, to come back out. And, you know, for most people who aren't our clients, that's no one, there, you know, there isn't really, not everyone gets the social work or the mental health help necessary to sort of overcome those issues. Not everyone has family support um, to do that. They may not have had it before they got in. Uh, if they did, they may have lost it when they went in. Um, it's, it's really complicated um, and it's pretty patchwork in terms of what resources are out there um, and someone's ability to access those resources if they do exist. And like Adlan said, so our social work department, we have, I think, like two or three social workers. One is uh, transitioning to um, another state to take care of her elderly parents. And so I don't know if we're going to have an opening, but if anyone has social work background, we, you know, could definitely use it because we, the fund that Adlan was talking about that we have for our clients who are exonerated is a very limited fund and it doesn't last, you know, as long in New York City as it does maybe in Oklahoma or like, you know, somewhere where, you know, a certain amount of money would, um, you know, last a lot longer. And so lawyers end up becoming in large part, you know, quasi social workers. And we haven't even really touched on how this, which I think you may have been asking about how the pandemic has affected our exonerated clients. And so we have clients, including one client who was actually just exonerated when he was on death row for almost a decade. And um, uh, his name is Clemente Aguirre. And, um, you know, you walk out of prison with no compensation, maybe like you said, 10 bucks, and very few exonerated, you know, men and women can bring a compensation lawsuit to seek, you know, monetary damages for the uh, number of years that they spent in prison as, you know, an innocent person. And so those who are able to and who succeed against the city for, you know, compensation wait a really long time to see that money. It can take a decade. It can, you know, take a really long time. And so, you know, a lot of our clients who are exonerated, they don't have health insurance. They don't have basic necessities. They don't have adequate shelter for the clients that I've seen who have thrived, it's people who had supportive family members who were with them the entire way. And so they have a house to go to, they have food, they have clothing. Um, but you know, if you don't, cleaning supplies become impossible to get, you know, basic necessities. And so it's, um, you know, we had a former client who said there are more resources for people who are guilty who get out than there are for the innocent. And so, um, you know, there is a greater network of support through the Innocence Network in the country now. And so there's, you know, we don't want to make it sound so dire because there are people who are trying to, you know, work on life after exoneration. Because for many people, you know, you see the lights and the cameras at the exoneration, but then no one is paying attention about what happens when your life begins again. Well, I I think that the saying, you know, that not all superheroes wear capes certainly applies to, to the two of you. And if I can just add one final kind of pitch for you guys is please share with us and our viewers what it is um, in any capacity that we can do to help the Innocence Project. Um, because as I can see in the chat, it's just claps and claps and claps and bravo. So wonderful work you're doing and please let us can know I, anything that we can do. Yeah, and if I can add, you know, uh, our religion was brought to humanity to um, to add human dignity to the way we we look at each other and and to add human dignity to human civilization and the one area um, that we don't see that human dignity for sure is uh, our our 
our, our prisons, our um, system where there's incarceration, what's now called the prison industrial complex. And I salute both of you, Seema and Adnan, in at least raising that point that at the very least, we have to treat all inmates with human dignity. That, that, that's more a measurement of what we are as a society than it is about what these people have or have not done. So in that sense, it's about the innocence, preserving the innocence of, of all of, uh, of our uh, members of society, not just those in prison. So thank you very much. I think that's a great sentiment. I appreciate you saying that. Thanks. Thank and I hope everybody who's listening can support the Innocence Project one way or the other. Uh, number one, they have a job opening if there are social <laughs> workers. Uh, I shouldn't apply. have posted that one. I don't know if they're posting for that, but they're posting for many positions, paralegal positions, um, attorney positions. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, that's a great way of contributing to societies by working for the Innocence Project. Go ahead, Edna. Well, I was gonna say, I mean, you know, obviously this is a tough time and a lot of people, we're a nonprofit, but I know a lot of a lot of organizations need money, so I'm not going to make a pitch for money. But I will say, sure. um, <laughs> uh, go ahead. <laughs> but um, I think it, you know one thing that is helpful is following us on social media and seeing the various you know campaigns that we're supporting. There's a lot of times we ask for people to sign petitions, whether it's to change you know, laws if we're involved in a sort of legislation campaign or to pressure, you know, prosecutors to do a certain thing on cases. So I think following us on social media and sort of being involved, engaging us in that way is, is helpful. Our website also has, um, it's much more user-friendly um, since we have this amazing digital, uh, I forget her title, but she's amazing. And so she has really uh, vamped up our website. And so there's ways to give and like different ways that are listed on the website. Um, Adnan mentioned the campaigns. There's also, there was, um, there's a email list you can join because I also joined it because I was trying to make sure I was aware of like, you know, different things that were being done that I might not be aware of just working on, you know, individual cases. And so there's, email list you can join to get latest updates. There was a campaign that said, contact your governor to encourage your governor to do X, Y, Z when it comes to, you know, preventing the spread of COVID-19 in jails and prisons. And so um, there's a lot of those things that, you know, can be done by calling, spreading awareness and that kind of stuff. It's also just keeping ourselves educated. You know, just, I feel so happy that you did this webinar because it made me get educated about a, like a number of issues. And so um, there are, you know, great websites. The Prison Policy Initiative is one. Um, but I think the Innocence Project, you know, when you get uh, to see like some of the things on our website and, and the email list, it will be a start to um, getting some of that education. Because we, I, I think, uh, you know, we're a criminal justice, you know, organization, and we like to leverage, you know, whatever influence we have with other um, criminal justice organizations. So perhaps following us can be a gateway into um, learning about the work of a lot of other organizations that are doing a lot of important work as well. well, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll try to amplify your work as much as possible, because it's very important and central to our faith and and uh, really now key, a key is we're dealing with COVID-19 and more issues than that beyond that. But uh, it, it's a good, I'm glad we had the opportunity to talk uh, today. So thank you very much, both of you, Seema and Adnan, for, for joining us. My, my mama always says that teamwork makes the dream work. So it's good to hear that we can all work together on making this um, a fruitful, you know, endeavor. Um, for our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I encourage you to join our next webinar with Rabbi Jack Moline this Friday at three o'clock PT, six o'clock ET. Um, and for anyone who is yet to register, you can register at www.mpac.org forward slash webinars. Thank you so much for joining Seema and Adnan, and thank you so much to our viewers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.